I'm loving this ride out of Mexico City today. The highway is mostly empty and I'm surrounded by beautiful pine forest. It's cold, but I don't mind because I'm going downhill and I know it's going to get warmer. The stench of pollution from Mexico City has been replaced by the smell of wood smoke and freshly cut pine timber. See that hill with the church on top of it right there? That's actually the world's largest pyramid. The Great Pyramid of Cholula doesn't get a lot of attention because, as I just mentioned, it looks mostly just like a hill now. This is because it was constructed mostly out of adobe rather than stone like the pyramids at Teotihuacan, but it does have a pretty awesome and intricate tunnel system that runs beneath it that you can walk through. At one time, the whole pyramid was probably faced with stone and painted with a bright white lime plaster, but not much of that exists anymore as the plaster eroded with time and the stone was eventually carted away to build other things. The few remaining megalithic artifacts are quite impressive, including this giant stone altar which I can only imagine has been soaked in the blood of thousands of human beings. When the Spanish arrived, one of the first things they did was build a church on top of the pyramid to assert their dominance. Photographs aren't allowed in the church, but I decided to turn my camera on and walk in and just play the dumb tourist card when the guy came to tell me I had to get out. Even better than all that, though, was lunch afterwards. Traditional gorditas. It's like a tortilla with beans inside, then smothered with green sauce and melted cheese. I can assure you that the deliciousness of this morsel was matched only by the elasticity of the cheese that it contained. Heading toward Jalapa, I was presented with a beautiful expanse of open pine and oak woodland. In fact, I was having trouble keeping my eyes on the road and I had to stop a few times just to take it all in. I arrived in Jalapa and eventually made my way to my friend Eugenia's house, where I promptly discovered that her mom is just the best cook. Like, ever. Seriously. If I wasn't just chronically unable to gain weight, there's no way the motorcycle would even carry me after all of that. I got my first taste of the sapote fruit, which I'm very eager to find more of, and also my first banana leaf tamale. They taste pretty similar to the tamales we have in the north, but because the banana leaf is larger, the tamale is larger, and I'm a big fan of that. Now, as much as it looks like we spent the whole time stuffing our faces with delicious, delicious food, we actually did do other things as well. Cord cob door knocker. A little ways south of Jalapa is a town called Coatepec, where, among other things, you can find an ancient bakery famous for its continued use of wood fired ovens. The ovens are massive, as you can tell by the size of the spatula the man is using to pull out the trays of bread, and they impart a unique, slightly smoky flavor to all the bread produced in this bakery, which I've found to be absolutely delicious. I also finally found time to change the oil in my motorcycle, which it probably badly needed. The cool thing was the neighborhood mechanic let me use his shop free of charge, and he even took care of the old oil for me. Jalapa also provided me with some excellent coffee and some much needed rest. Two things that sound like they should be mutually exclusive, but actually went hand in hand quite nicely. I'm just a few miles outside of Jalapa, things are really starting to warm up. The air is thick with the molasses -y smell of sugar production. Things are green, it's extremely humid. Palm trees, coconuts, giant cactus. Finally feels tropical. 
The air is thicker down here. I feel like I'm wading through a pool. I can feel it push me around more. It's really humid and warm. It's actually very pleasant. I just stopped at a roadside stand for some pineapple juice. Absolutely delicious. Quite a bit of traffic on this road as well, but it's certainly not as bad as Mexico City. Eugenia's mom packed a lunch for me. I got some leftover mole enchiladas. And I wish I just could have stayed in Jalapa and eaten her food for the rest of my life. In Cozacolcos, I met up with my incredibly generous host, Mauricio. He's a teacher involved in both public and private schooling, and right now his biggest project is converting his family's ranch into a sort of eco-park where students will be exposed to both aspects of agriculture and the natural world. Right now he's working on constructing this maze of islands and lakes out of the swampy ground that covers most of his family's land. He told me that once they had started to create more diverse habitat, a greater diversity of animals appeared as well. Ducks started nesting on one of the islands, and crocodiles started to appear in all of the lakes. He mentioned that he was thinking of converting this into a wolf farm as well, and I eagerly encouraged him to do so. I hope that next time I can return as a woofer instead of a couch surfer. And now for something completely different, a plant that moves when you poke it. Mauricio's little slice of paradise has huge potential, and I have no doubt that with someone as enthusiastic as him behind it, great things will happen. And I hope that on my way back home I can stop by and lend a hand. On my way towards Palenque, I ran into this guy. His name is Hener. He's from Tabasco, and his bike was puking oil out of a stripped valve cover bolt. It turned out I had the right tools in my toolkit to do a quick fix repair on his bike. We topped off his bike with some of the extra oil I was carrying, rode together for a while, and then went our separate ways. I hope he made it home alright. This week's episode is brought to you by the boob sign. This may or may not mean there's a wild pig crossing here. I arrived in Palenque and set up camp next to this motorhome here, which was piloted by a family from Canada who were on their 99th day of travel south. A little while later, a guy from France pulled up on a BMW F700. He has a very impressive map on the side of his panniers, and since he's heading north, I got to pick his brain about all the places that I'm about to go. It's been raining now for, oh, at least 12 hours straight. Just about everything I own except the clothes I'm wearing is soaking wet. I don't have much hope for drying it any time in the future either. Turns out the tent is not waterproof after two hours of downpour. I never really had an opportunity to test it past that in Arizona. But uh, yeah, 12 hours of, of rain is too much. I've learned a valuable lesson about the rainforest. You see that thatched roof above me? It's still completely dry in here after 24 hours of rain. At my supposedly waterproof tent, didn't last more than two hours. Um, needless to say, I uh, broke down and got a room. But rain or shine, ancient ruins wait for no one. So the Frenchman, whose name I'm purposely avoiding having to pronounce, and I headed off to Palenque. In the rain, the ruined temples took on an especially eerie quality. Coupled with the lack of tourists, it made for a very surreal experience. One of the most fascinating things I encountered was this little stalagmite growing in one of the interior windows of one of the temples. Because these so structures first, are constructed largely of limestone, they're subject names to the so same laws of erosion that, that create caves in the natural I know. world. <laughs> the architecture here is incredibly yeah. impressive, but equally Guillaume. so were the artifacts in no, the I'm museum. Just gonna call you Guy. The Maya were the only civilization <laughs> in the Americas to develop a true system of writing, and it was extremely complex Perfect. and artistic, making frequent use of both human forms and mythical creatures. The next morning, the Frenchman and I had found that the rain had finally stopped. And we also discovered that our routes overlapped as far as Okasingo. So naturally, we decided to ride together. So first, can you tell me your name so that I can pronounce it? Oh, you will never succeed. I know. <laughs> so it's too French. Yeah. It's Guillaume. 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 Uh, I'm just going to call you Guy. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you can call me Bob if you want. <laughs> no problem for me. Perfect. Riding with Guy was really nice for a change. As you can probably guess from the map on his panniers, he was much more experienced than I am. He drove much faster on the wet and windy mountain roads than I ever would have alone. But the good thing was that trying to keep up with him forced me to push the limits of my comfort zone. And I think that in the two hours that we rode together, I learned more than I would have in months of solo riding. At Okasingo, we said our goodbyes and went our separate ways, and I was back on the road alone, but with a renewed sense of confidence in my abilities. I arrived in Comitan to a warm welcome from my couch host Julia and her three very happy dogs. She has the biggest cock I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm talking about a rooster. Get your mind out of the gutter. There's also an absolutely adorable little group of flock? School of? Uh, if anybody knows the correct plurality of ducks, please leave it in the comments. Thank you.
I was finally able to dry out all my wet things from the Palenque experience, and then Julia and I headed downtown to experience a little bit of the nightlife. The next morning, Don Jorge here took me to see an absolutely gigantic market that rambled on for blocks and blocks. And now, since there's no internet at Julia's house, I'm sitting at a cafe trying to upload this video. As usual, if you guys have any comments or questions or suggestions or anything, please let me know. And I'll see you guys next time from Guatemala.